All right. Our, our next talk is from Emil Todorov. Um, Emil is an affiliate professor at University of Washington and the founder of Roboti LLC. His work spans across optimum control, neuroscience, and robotics. Um, Emo is also the key person behind Mujoko, which is a simulator that is widely used in the robot learning community. So without further ado, uh, let's start with the uh, talk. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about model-based optimization with Mujoko physics, but first I, I want to tell you a little bit about Mujoko physics itself. Uh, 3.0 was just released by the good people at uh, DeepMind. Um, there's one particular module which I was, uh, I added basically, I, I sold it to them, but I still had a contract to add some things. I'm finally done, by the way, as of two weeks ago, my Mujoko software development career is finished. So now I'm a free man. I can go and, you know, develop foundational models for <laughs> for the stock market, probably not for robotics, <laughs> to be honest with you. But anyway, um, so uh, this flex thing, it allows you to simulate uh, flexible uh, objects. Uh, you define a bunch of vertices that are in, in moving bodies, and then you have elements that are either 1D or 2D or 3D, so you can do like ropes or surfaces or, or volumetric uh, entities. Uh, the idea is that each of those uh, elements is basically going to stretch as the vertices move and then when they collide uh, the forces are going to be distributed on all the bodies so it's a very non-trivial generalization so now if you have contact points where the force is, is distributed on up to eight bodies like if you have two of those things colliding um, and then to preserve the soft shape of it you can either desi uh, design edge quality constraints with stiffness damping or there's a really nice elasticity plugin written by Alessio Colino, who is uh, sitting there that actually uses material science and gives you very nice um, uh, behavior out of these things. So let me just show you. So here I'm just uh, showing you how, if you don't have any shape preservation, you can just move these things and they stretch and they can collide anywhere you want. Here's a piece of um, yellow cheese. Uh, so, so here, these flexible things, uh, the degrees of freedom are the usual Muchoku degrees of freedom, the rigid bodies. Uh, but now we, we connect them with those flexible stretchy elements. They don't have their internal degrees of freedom. They just, we all degrees of freedom, but they give you nice collisions and nice dynamics. This is, a, this is that elasticity plugin that really behaves like a real thing. Uh, how fast are these things? Well, if you load a very large model, it's going to slow down, but uh, they're still kind of job speed. Uh, now, to how do you create those models? There is, so there's a low-level XML element called flex that allows you to give you full power of everything. There's a thing called flex composite, which automates them. In particular, you can now load a mesh, including a volumetric mesh from a file format called GMesh, it's like a really nice software for mesh editing. Um, and then Mujoku will automatically create your 10,000 bodies with all the joints and all the elements, and then you get these soft things and you can wiggle around. So if your simulations were getting like too fast and it was like embarrassing and there was no more research to get uh, done and publish papers, this will slow you down all you want. <laughs> like the sky is the limit with how, how complicated you can make those things. Now, uh, I want to talk about op uh, optimizing with uh, physics. Uh, so Mujoku physics was really, I mean, I spent a lot of time developing the physics, but really I developed, designed it so that we can do optimization, and optimal control. Uh, it's just a summary of the physics formulation, which we're going to be using later. So photo dynamics is designed, uh, defined as a convex optimization problem something called the extended Gauss principle. So basically, you uh, minimize the sum of two terms. The first one will give you F equals MA, if you minimize just that. And the second one is a penalty in acceleration space, which enforces all the constraints softly. It's a convex function, so it's uniquely uh, defined, and there is a Newton software that solves it. Um, you can very easily do inverse dynamics because you just ask where is the gradient of that thing equals zero and you get equals uh, F equals M MA plus your uh, constraint Jacobian times the gradient of this uh, penalty function. So basically the gradient of your constraint penalty function 
turns out to be the constraint force. Everything is uh, differentiable except for the contact Jacobians. That's very unfortunate because the way collision geometry is usually defined, you can't differentiate it. There may be some work on that to fix that, but everything else you can get derivatives. Uh, so this acceleration penalty usually is the convex quadratic spline, unless you have elliptical friction cones where some of the pieces become non-quadratic, but leave that alone. So that means the inverse dynamics is piecewise affine in the acceleration, and that's convenient. Now, um, we're going to use that to go over some uh, algorithms that are, like use these unique uh, properties. So just to step back a little bit. So most people who use Mujoku use it uh, to do model free learning as if they're collecting data in the real world. And that's great, but the simulator gives you a lot of power that you don't get in the real world because you can compute stuff that your robot cannot compute for itself. And so the algorithms I'm looking at is what can you do in simulation that you cannot do in the real world? In other words, what quantities can your simulator compute that plug into some optimization method? Uh, and in particular, I'm interested in how you uh, do optimal control in the presence of contacts, which are nasty and discontinuous. So this is the first contact related complication I'll address. Um, suppose you have one state, position and velocity, and there is some contact somewhere. Now, if you apply different forces, which are your control signals, those contacts can instantaneously switch into different modes, like stick or slip or break, which gives you some kind of piecewise smooth uh, optimization mosaic over things you're trying to solve. So how do you handle that? Well, if you have just local optimization, you would land in one piece of the mosaic. Uh, so for example, in IOQR, you do a forward pass, you land somewhere, then a backward pass, you're going to linearize and quadratize in that piece, and you never realize there are other pieces. The next forward pass might put you somewhere else, but that's just an, that's a lucky accident, basically. You didn't plan that, it happened by chance. So what we can do is thing called, what I'm calling goal-directed dynamics. So what is that? You can think of it as a hierarchical control. So imagine a high-level controller that hands down desired accelerations. Or more specifically, it, it hands down cost functions over accelerations. They're not the RL cost functions. Think of them as potential functions. Okay, so this, uh, this tells us what acceleration we would like to get out of the system. And then the GDD is a dynamical system which finds the feasible acceleration that minimizes the thing that you handed me down plus that what looks like a control cost. So I take the position velocity acceleration that I'm considering, run inverse dynamics through that, uh, apply a quadratic cost, which is like a control cost, and then I can constrain the accelerations to a feasible set if your system is underactuated, or you can just hide that in the control cost. Uh, so that is a non-smooth, non-convex constraint problem. Um, it looks really scary. The good news is that if you design a Gauss-Newton solver with clever line searches that actually knows where the edges of this mosaic are, which we know because they're analytically like defined, uh, you can get either the global minimum or something pretty much in the single show from it, only two times slower than the forward dynamics. So just to sum up here, so forward dynamics maps from force to acceleration, and it's a convex smooth optimization problem. Inverse dynamics goes from acceleration to force, and that's an analytical formula. That's great. Go, this goal-directed dynamics goes from a cost of accelerations to both a force and an acceleration, which are guaranteed to be compatible through both the forward and inverse dynamics. And that's non-convex, non-smooth, shadow problem. But it just happens to be one that can be solved very, very quickly. So let me show you an example. So here I'm just going to do this heuristically. I'm going to be a designer of those desired accelerations. I'm going to hand it down to a GDD dynamics and see what it does. How am I going to do that? I'm going to put a couple of different terms. Basically, I'm going to select the body part on this model. I'm going to have a spatial target that says, where do I want to go? Then my desired acceleration will be the acceleration of a spring damper just, that just accelerates towards that target. And then I'll put some other things like virtual damping and desired poses. So here's my thing. So here, what I'm doing is I'm selecting a body part, like the one that's highlighted, and I'm moving this red marker around. And so what this thing is doing is completely greedy choosing joint torques that seems to be basically doing what I thought. So there's absolutely no policy, no learning, no trajectory optimization. This is one step greedy control. And you can see it's, it's very, 
interesting behaviors that emerged that seem, almost seem like somebody might have planned them, except they didn't. So this is just a, <laughs> it's kind of crawling accidentally. Uh, here's a Adam's family hand, it's trying to go towards that thing. Here's a, like you can do control arms like, like that. So it's a, it's a very interesting thing. This is some timings to sh show that <coughs> basically it's within two X of the forward dynamics. Now, how can we use that uh, in planning? So consider the following reformulation of control, which is exactly identical. So suppose we treat the acceleration as the control signal. That makes the system perfectly linear without, we're not, we're not approximating anything that, that's just a fact. Then we're going to impose a running cost, which says any cost over position and uh, velocity that you want, that's the state cost. And then we are going to put a control cost on the output of the inverse dynamics. And again, pick uh, under actuation properly. So this is your Bellman equation from optimal control. And now if you look at this thing here, you notice that this is exactly this GDD dynamics that I defined. So what, what does that mean? That means what I'm basically doing is if you look at your Q function in, in RL in optimal control, this GDD dynamics is optimizing all the actions at one point in time. And it's doing it super fast by exploiting all the properties of Munchoko and, and it's only two times slower than, than forward dynamics. So with that, we could uh, build uh, both uh, policies or sampling methods or, or our QR things that I would be very interesting. I haven't done that, but look forward to doing it now that I'm a retired Munchoko developer. Um, Another thing you can, of course, do is just do uh, direct trajectory optimization. So represent trajectory as equals to poses, com uh, compute positions and velocities by finding a difference in time, apply the inverse dynamics to get, to get the forces that gave you that trajectory, define some cost that can be independent on position, velocity, acceleration, the forces, and any other features that got, but all of them depend on those things. You can impose under actuation, and then we can solve it with some, I prefer Gauss-Newton. Uh, now, an interesting thing here, that I don't know how many people use that, but when you use these direct methods, you can actually parallelize over time segments of the trajectory, right? Because most of the computation here is performed on triplets of states, and there's no interaction among them. The only place where you serialize, at the end of the day, you get a band diagonal Hessian that you need to factorize. But that turns out to be a relatively small fraction of the overall computation. So. This is, this is important because if you want to do something like MPC and you have a 20 core processor, how to you use your 20 cores in MPC was well, really annoying. You do a forward pass, which is serial, then you do a backward pass, which is serial, and most of your processors are sitting there doing nothing, unless you're sampling like DeepMind, which is a good idea. Well, with this, you can actually split the trajectory in multiple chunks. So here's an example. So here we're going to optimize a cyclic tra trajectory, which we can do just by saying that the last step is equal to the first step, um, 200 time steps. So here we're just going to rely on the soft contacts of Mujoko and see what happens, keep our fingers crossed. That particular case, it, it works. So here's the initialization. We've pinned the top and bottom states and we're asking them to find the cycle basically. So it's optim it optimized through all the contacts happily um, as if nothing bad happened. Um, it takes a while in terms of iterations, but it's it's less than a second to compute that. Here's an interesting picture that uh, I'd like to point out. So this is the, somewhere during the optimization, this is the gradient of the overall trajectory cost. And it's plotted as a function of time. So these are the time steps in the trajectory, and these are the gradients with respect to various terms. And you can see that it's very spiky in time. Why is it spiky? Because when contacts occur, that's when the, that's where the action is and almost all the gradient is there and then, but then if you try to do first sort of line stretch along that, you're going to make a little bit of progress and then your cost will go and shoot up and then you're going to be stuck. This is the corrected gradient given by Gauss-Newton. So you take the gradient multiplied by the inverse approximate Jacobian. And now what you see is you, you get something a lot nicer that actually has information at all points in time and not just the gradients. And so when you optimize with that, then, then you get qualitatively better performance. So my experience has been generally that gradient descent for these things is a total disaster. Once you go to Gauss-Newton, it changes things qualitatively and, and, and now you're in business. Uh, of course, if you did 
stochastic gradient descent and waited long enough, obviously it's going to convert. You can even prove that, but I don't want to wait long enough. I'm getting old, I don't have time. Um, now, here's another complication related to contacts. So we know that in a given task that involves contacts, we should go make contact to get the job done. But how does an optimizer know that? In particular, if you have some current solution, which state or trajectory policy, which does not give you contact, how does an optimizer know that you should go make contact and then that enables you to allow force, to apply forces that get the job done? In locomotion, that's not a problem because the gravity was always going to bring you down to earth and uh, you're going to make contact, so you don't need to discover them. But in general, that's a tricky question. So the optimization landscape basically may look like something like this. You are not in contact, so this is the best you can get. If you go to a place where you can make contact, all of a sudden, really good solutions become possible. But how do you locally discover that from here you should go here? Uh, so this is, uh, there's a, a cost of matters called contact environment optimization that we developed a while ago in, in my lab, where basically we said we're going to detect contacts from large distances. We're going to allow virtual contact forces from a distance. And so when you do that, you're going to discover that, you know, if I push on that thing that's over there, I, it's good because I moved the chair and that's good for my task. Okay, so now I have to go and make contact with it, basically. So this produced a really nice uh, results at the time. So there are things that, i us just fast forward through this video, but basically, so, so this entire trajectory is that a plant as one, as one very long plan, all these contacts are, are being planned through trajectory optimization, basically. Uh, you can do like multiple agents, like synchronizing each other. You can do like hands doing doing stuff. So, so this was this this was uh, really good. There's some problems with it, which is uh, the physics and the costs are really fine. So, there's not this is not a physical this is not a physical system. Basically, this is somewhere between animation and physics. Also, it it took a a while. Like it took five to ten minutes to compute one of those long trajectories. So uh, what I've been doing recently is kind of clean this up and make it faster and, and better defined with physics. So the idea is this. The idea is to take, um, allow inverse trajectory optimization where you can consider states that are not physical. In particular, you can make things fly that should not be actuated. Now, inverse dynamics is going to tell you that you're applying some magic forces that are very expensive. And they're going to be penalized by some quadratic uh, cost on forces. And now we're going to replace this kind of cost with CIO cost. And what that, what that will say is, well, that expensive cost that you have, I can pay for it by reducing some of these magic forces as long as they're compatible with some kind of remote contacts. So in other words, I can allow myself to imagine contact forces from a distance, which can account for your magic forces that you gave yourself to fly over there. And so here's a really a little example of that. So red uh, point we can control. The green thing is passive. The task is to get the green thing to go to the white target, right? So if you did RL with exploration or whatever, you probably never going to solve that task, basically, if this is far away, because you know nothing local that you do here is going to tell you that touching this thing is good. You cannot move this thing. This thing is supposed to go there, but you don't have a control that moves this thing. Um, so what, what CL would do is we'll say, well, we we'll do, let's do inverse dynamics. We're going to discover that the green thing should actually go there. And then we're going to discover the red thing should go and, 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 and do the green thing. So basically this allows you to reason about the utility of contacts from a distance and then go and make those contacts. And that just falls out of, of that, adding that cost correction to, to your overall cost. And, and you're doing it in a continuation method so that there is this C parameter here, you can turn to zero and then it gives you exactly the original cost. Um, and I think that I really like is, a lot of people have done that, but so this, this idea here is uh, splitting, doing both MPC and value function learning at the same time. So do MPC up to some horizon, evaluate some value function approximator on the horizon, and then offline uh, learn the value function from Bellman residuals. So, so that turned out to be a really good thing. This we did that for a while. So these are various points. So here the task is to move the cube from A to B. Just figures out how to use a human to move a cube. 
uh, is jittery because the MPC was done with sampling MPC, not with iterative OQR MPC. Also so solves this kind of task. So we found here that compared to just a policy gradient, it re re uh, reduces the number of samples between 10 and 100 times, depending on, on, on the task. Uh, and so I think in general, this is this kind of idea of the combining trajectory optimization with policy or value function learning is really good. And, and uh, you can cache a lot of information in those policies or values, including from some uh, demonstration data, not, not necessarily from trajectories. So um, finally, I'm, I mentioned this before, which I, I was working on it for a while. Actually, I almost released it in 2020. It, it, there is, the, there's a thing that exists. I mean, it, it was like two months away from a release. Then the pandemic happened, and um, the good people of Seattle went crazy and, and shut down everything. And at the end, they got COVID anyway. Uh, <laughs> my response to that to go to Florida, where everyone got COVID too, but without going crazy. Uh, and so now I. I introduced another problem when I did that, which is harder than contact optimization, which is how do you write code when you live here? <laughs> <laughs> and I have almost solved that problem, not quite. But anyway, so, so this will happen. It will be released next year for sure. Um, so, so here, what, what, what this is, it's basically optimal control toolbox sitting on top of Muchoko using a lot of the tricks I just talked about, plus others that I don't have time for. So it's both an end user software for model-based optimization with UI project files, etc. as well as an SDK for people who want to develop their own algorithms that you can hook up through Python or C++. It's fully multi-threaded, including uh, built-in cost functions. I don't want people writing cost functions in silly Python, serializing the whole thing, and wasting like 80% of the time. So you heard that uh, I said Jim is a good thing, right? Uh, it's fast. It's actually the throughput of the simulator itself is very similar to Mujoko running on the CPU fully multi-threaded. The reason why you're slow on the CPU is because you were seduced by the dark side of Python. You did things easily. And then Python managed to creep into the simulator and uh, and slow things down because you serialize things. So to get rid of so basically when you when you run things on a GPU, you you benefit from the additional software engineering that shoot it your Python from actually what's going on, <laughs> not so much from the device. Uh, so you see when that's out that, that it works just as fast. Um, anyway, so that's why I want a built-in uh, cost function. I don't want users writing cost function. I want users specifying cost function in some kind of language, which gets evaluated internally, gets differentiated internally, gets multi-traded properly, and no one can get in the way. Uh, so this is going to have a bunch of trajectory optimization methods, clever, clever tricks that I mentioned here. Uh, We'll probably have some policy and value function learning with a native MLP implementation. And if you want Torch and such, do it yourself, but a good reasons to do that with the overall emphasis on the methods I, I talked about. So I'm happy to take questions at this point, but, but actually I have a question for the audience, which is what can I, what kind of software I can offer you along these lines that you would find useful in your own work? So, you know, feature requests, whatever. You don't have to think of it now. You can uh, catch me later or, or send me an email. But uh, I'm still, you know, redesigning things. So I have an opportunity to, you know, take user feedback into account. Thanks. All right. Any questions? Thanks, Emma. Uh, I got a high level general question. So, so we, we are seeing more and more progress from seeing to real large scale planning, uh, this progress. But you seem to take a conservative uh, view in all these works. So I'm wondering, like, do you see a near future where the seem to real gap is close enough, small being small enough that we can ignore it? Or you don't think that's, that's going to never be the case? So I think that probably the best way to reduce the sectorial gap is to put some effort into system identification. It doesn't sound sexy enough to publish in a single one paper, so here's what you do. Call it learning. <laughs> <laughs> You're learning the parameters of your model using machine learning, 
artificial general intelligence showing the foundational model. And at the end, of the day, they get the parameters of the model, which is the model, right? I think that would actually help a lot. It's very rare that people do it properly. Um, um, I, I think. think MPC is a really good way to improve performance in, in real systems because it really is very adaptive, especially if you have computing power to do it in an ensemble way. So that you, if you could optimize, if you can do opti op, uh, MPC through like five models with different parameters, I think that that will improve things a lot. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, the real world is not the same as the simulator, right? So there's going to be always going to be some. Yeah. Thank you.